Hello, uh, Namaste everyone. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. We at the Indic Forum have conducted around 11 events last year. Uh, for more than a year, we have given platform to more than 15 authors who have written scholarly books on many mainstream topics of general interest around Indology, history, dharma and such. Uh, we are mostly volunteer driven and rely on donations of our listeners. And we try to promote authors, arrange book tours, conduct real world events, and so on. Um, if you wish to donate us, you can always donate us via Zelle or by sending us checks. The details are on our website, indicforum.org. Uh, our mission is to promote uh, such authors who have written high quality books that can appeal to the wide audience internationally, um, who have earned the respect of their peers and who can be seen as experts in their respective fields. We specifically focus on areas like history, Indology, uh, Dharma, philosophy, uh, and so on. So today uh, we have the pleasure of having one such author with us, uh, Mrs. Sana Singh. Uh, Sana Ji is a civil engineer by training and also has a master's degree in environmental uh, sciences. And uh, she has been working in those fields and eventually she took up writing as um, her career. and. She won many awards for her writing, especially uh, around water and water management. Um, and then, uh, of course, she has written a very important book, The Educational Heritage of Ancient India, and a follow-up book, Revisiting the Ed Educational Heritage of India, which are about the history of Indian education system. Uh, we all know like India had great universities once upon a time, um, and a very good uh, educational system, people around the world came to India for education and eventually, as we know, it also declined. So in her book, she basically covers the history of Indian education system. And that's the topic she's going to talk about today with us. So having said that, I'll give the floor to Sana Ji. Namaste, namaste to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Indic Forum, for inviting me. It's been a while since I spoke at a webinar. Uh, so I've had a nice uh, period of rest and contemplation. So um, thank you very much. Uh, so my book uh, on uh, India's educational heritage is the second one. The first one was published in two, uh, 2017. And um, it was a very small book. So I felt that there is a need for more detail. And I wrote a second one in uh, 2021. I used the period of uh, the lockdown to, uh, to research and write my second book. And that's what I have been talking about in various forums. And that has led me on into uh, more and more uh, interesting journeys. Because one, when you write about India's educational heritage, then you want to know if it is being preserved today in any form. And that has led me into discovering gurukulas in uh, all over India. And so most of the time when I travel to India, I go to gurukulas, I go to educational institutions where they are aware of India's educational heritage and, and see what they are doing with it. So um, let me just uh, share my screen and show you my slides. So this is the book, Revisiting the Educational Heritage of India. One second, it's not moving, yeah. So I want to tell you about institutions that have come down, come, come from antiquity. So when we talk about India's educational heritage, we're going very far back into history, which has probably not been very well documented by the uh, by today's, uh, I mean, they have not been studied by today's historians to that extent. It is a very ancient tradition of formal discipline teaching, which attracted students from around the world. So uh, most of the studies that have been done are, you know, relating to the last 1500 years but actually we might we, we probably extend even earlier than that uh, even before there were buildings even before there were solid um, uh, universities we were having universities in the forest and we was continuing this whole tradition of learning and this we know because we have important rites of passage which are woven into our culture we have a, a, so many of these samskaras that we have the traditions uh, marking the passage of time in a in a person's life, and they are related to education. So we have Vidyarambha, 
we have upanayana samavartana these are all different uh, ceremonies that we have in which people are invited and they give blessings to the to the person for whom this is being performed and vidyarambha is uh, i'll be showing you a picture of how it is a, a ceremony where a child learns how to read and write upanayana is going into higher learning samavartana is graduation we had the concept of guru runa you know we have uh this unique concept in um, in hinduism where we have certain debts that we have to pay back and guru runa is the debt that we owe to the gurus who have taught us which would be the gurus who have taught us directly as well as the gurus of the gurus and various other who stretch into um into a very long time uh, back in time um where the the knowledge has been passed on so we are we have a debt towards all those gurus who preceded even our current gurus and so we have this debt that we have to teach we have to teach more students and pass on the knowledge and of course we have to lead the life that the guru has led and guru wants us to lead now uh, students who were specializing in a particular subject were called by a group name that denoted the subject this also shows you it's woven into the language so when you look at sanskrit uh, when you study sanskrit you'll find lot of words which tell you the disciplines that were being uh, pursued in ancient times so for example paniniya uh, are the people who are studying panini oh sorry i just jumped a bullet point Let, i go back to how the uh, group name denoted the subject so yagnya those who studied yagnya were called yagnika vyakarana those who studied grammar were called vyakarnas for example my uh, great grandfather krishnachar was called uh, vyakarana krishnacharya because that was his profession he was uh, uh, that was his mission that was his whole life teaching vyakarana and researching into it uh, anu brahmana uh, would be anu brahmani so those who studied anu brahmana literature would be called anu brahmanis so the subject uh, would denote the students and similarly the acharya the the acharyas that the students studied would also give them a name like those who studied panini were called paniniya uh, those who studied apishali would be called apishali sorry apishali then uh, uh, shakata uh, shakatayana would be called the sh students would be called shakatayana yaniya actually shakata yaniya would be the students of shakatayana so in this way those who are studying different uh, the the schools of thought started by any great guru would be denoted by that name all these show you that we were so uh, we were so ancient we have been studying all these subjects for a long time we had a very nature centered education so na nature was seen as an important teacher and we were also seen as part of nature this is a very important distinguishing feature of our educational heritage that you know we were never seeing ourselves as separate from nature and there are so many instances you'll come across so many stories which talk about how the higher truth was achieved with the help of observing nature so everything around us in nature was teaching us something that's the way we perceived the world so uh, gurus would often send students to uh, graze the cows bring water from the well and these would be used as teaching moments you know uh, change of seasons so observing nature you would see seasons are changing leaves are falling new leaves are coming so all these are giving us lessons to apply in our own life understanding that the the tree is within the seed itself all these concepts came from nature so when you are looking at a seed it's not just a mere seed it holds the tree in itself which is about to come which is going to be manifested so these kind of higher truths were taken from nature itself and nature would be studied in such great detail that we had subjects like botany zoology astronomy all from ancient times if you go back and see the subjects that were studied so uh, soil health um, you know observing the night sky this was done in such great detail that we knew the periodicity of different planets you know how how much time they take to orbit or the stars you know which are changing in the horizon which shows that we are, we are ourselves rotating and revolving so all these things were studied in great detail and they were entire disciplines that were then passed on to the next generation water catchments were studied so you know they knew that you know the slope of everything has to be in such a way that it uh, that the water flows towards the the river so that you know you know you do not have different uh, levels when you build which causes stagnation of water or flooding all these things were studied rain water harvesting how do you build 
uh, little tanks or big tanks which will collect rainwater so that they serve you in dry periods. All these were studied in great detail in a very practical way and the rules of thumb were passed on from generation to generation. So sustainability was inbuilt in every discipline because Prakriti was not meant for exploitation. So humans were a part of Prakriti and Prakriti was a conscious entity. People understood that this is not some inert thing that we are a part of. There is something living here. So the rivers, everything, they're all living entities. And so we deal with them in that way. Just like you will, um, if you destroy a river, it's like killing a person. So that's the way they looked at nature. There was enormous value attached to education. It was the foremost duty of every individual. So the, everybody understood that education is very important. But we must remember that there were two systems of education. There was a jati-based skill training, um, you know, which all the jatis were, were actually transmitting knowledge. So, so we don't see it today as that. We think of them as caste system because that's the way we have been taught. But all these jatis were preserving knowledge in a very structured way. Right from childhood, the ch children born into a certain jati were absorbing the knowledge and they would watch their parents, they would watch their teachers also uh, embodying that knowledge. And that's the way so many skills were passed down. And we also were the richest country in the world uh, for quite some time because we had all these different jatis who were preserving knowledge of arts and crafts and various other um, you know, skills. Then we had the academic disciplines which were based on Veda. Those were rigorous study where the students go to the Gurukulas, they stay with the Guru and they learn. So that was another system. But both of them were more or less, they were based on the Vedas. So the Veda, the, the what was in the Veda, whether it was studied directly or not, the knowledge of the Veda permeated every discipline and every form of uh, knowledge transmission, knowledge, uh, the teaching of knowledge. There were no artificial barriers between religion and science. Um, just a minute. I'm just seeing some messages. I hope that... No, please ignore the messages. You can continue uh, yeah, talking. Okay. I, I'll look at the messages. If something okay. is... So there were no barriers between religion and science. It was not said that, you know, this is religion. So we are not going to be bringing it into mathematics. We are not going to be bringing it into physics. That was not the way they studied it. Everything was an integrated whole. So when you are studying astronomy, you would be paying your respect to the sun, to the moon, to all the entities. At the same time, you would be studying them scientifically. So there was no uh, kind of friction, as you see in the way it developed in the West, where uh, religion had to be completely excluded and we, they needed secular subjects where religion would not intrude because they didn't want interference from the priests uh, in, their, in the churches. Whereas for us, it wasn't like that. It was all integrated and it was perfectly all right to pray to an entity before you try to study it, you know. Uh, so every subject was approached with a spirit of scientific inquiry as well as Shraddha and there was no dissonance. Experiential learning was very important. So things would not be just told to the student that this is what it is. This, the guru would make sure that the student experiences what is being taught and that is how the tasks would be given out. So gurus did not often answer questions directly. They made the students arrive at the answer from their own experience. So the students can ask questions, but the teacher may or may not give the answer. That was the culture of the time. The teacher would know what is the question in the mind and would accordingly give different kinds of tasks to different students because different students learned in different ways. So in that way also, the Gurukula system was very advanced which is today a new concept that, you know, it is uh, student-centric and the teacher should know how each student underst understands uh, understands or learns. So that is exactly the way the guru would teach in the ancient times. It would not be the same thing taught to everybody. Different ways would be used. So this is the picture of uh, uh, um, Aksha Vidya, Vidya Rambha, which is, uh, I've, this is a Bengali uh, ritual going on here, Hate Kodi, which is similar to the Vidya Rambha in uh, southern India. And this thing is uh, was dying out. I was not seeing this have, uh, being celebrated much in families. Uh, but I think it is now uh, making a comeback. It's a very important ceremony. In Bengal, they do it during Saraswati Puja. So the very first time a girl or a boy learns how to trace the alphabet is celebrated. It is such an important event. Then Upanayana, which a lot of us know, 
Uh, but today's world, I think it is done mechanically sometimes, just go through this whole uh, ceremony of, you know, getting the sacred thread. But it has a lot of deep meanings. And if you go back and understand what, what it means, then you will, you will see the importance that was given to education in our culture. So I have a map, which is also in the book, uh, showing all the centers of advanced education in India. And these are in different time zones. They're not all at the same time. Uh, because different uh, scho uh, different scholars who came to study in India, they have uh, uh, studied in different institutions and mentioned what, what was existing at the time. So I've put them all in a map. Uh, and you can see that there are so many universities in um, eastern India. There is a whole cluster. You can see Nalanda. Uh, you can see Vikramshila. You can see uh, Somapura, Jagaddala, right? Telhara, Mithila. Telhara was only recently dug out just about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. So there are still many, many universities that have not been excavated. Uh, and so, you know, if more money is put into archaeology, we'll probably find out that there are more sites. Uh, so many of these sites are now beyond the borders of India because I, now they have, India has been partitioned. But there was a time when they were all part of the same, um, you could say, the same culture. And uh, in the north, you can see uh, Sharda Pitha, you can see Purushapura, uh, Takshashila, all these are very, very important centers of learning. Many of them were temples, you know, temples were also centers of learning because knowledge is sacred. Saraswati is the goddess of learning. Sharda Peet in uh, Kashmir was, uh, uh, the whole place was called Sharda Desh because Sharda, that whole center was known for learning and was producing the finest of scholars. And even Takshashila was very close. So that whole region was full of learned people pursuing subjects to great depth. And they used to be invited to different countries. So many of them have been invited to China. So from the Kashmir region, a lot of scholars were invited to China and asked to translate books into the, into the Chinese language. Then you go to the south and you can see so many temple universities there. Kanchipuram, uh, Shringeri, Ennairam. Ennairam in Tamil Nadu is a place where many inscriptions have been found, which show that education was so institutionalized because there are inscriptions telling how many students are studying in this institute, how much money is to be uh, allotted to the students. Uh, so the ones who are studying higher subjects are being getting are getting more resources compared to the ones who are studying basic subjects. All these things are actually there in inscriptions and more are being revealed as archaeology is, uh, archaeological excavations are happening. More uh, inscriptions are being found out. Then in the West, you can see Vallabhi, which is in Gujarat, uh, again, a very famous center of learning, which taught administration, uh, political sciences, finance. So which is very interesting because even today we can see that continuing in Gujarat, right? Gujarat is a place where we know that a lot of businessmen have come from, industrialists have come from, and this culture has been there for a long time. So the, and we also have record of the, the different professors moving around and setting up new universities. And we have record of students traveling to the, to the centers of their choice. So this making this map was a very pleasurable exercise for me. In my first book, it's a very simple map with not, with only 20, 30 centers of learning. And in this one, it's uh, uh, almost a hundred centers of learning that I came to know and I've plotted in this map. So, so one question here is like, what is the source of this map? Uh, so you have created so the, it yourself. So the source of this map is from the traveler's accounts, like Zuan Zhang, uh, when he came to India, he has mentioned a lot of these viharas he found. So I've used that. And I've used mm -hmm. many other uh, traveler's accounts, which are there in the book. If you go to the bibliography, you will find mention of all those sources. So from there, I have come to know. And of course, in the records of the temples itself, you'll find that they are saying, you know, in the Sthala Purana of the various temples, they would say that, this temple was a center of learning. So I have used those, um, I have uh, marked those places as well. Like Hampi, for instance, there is a there is a, there is a traveler who mentioned that this is a center of learning, that it is in ruins, but it looks, uh, it was known to be a university. So I've used that. So traveling was an important part of education. This is so interesting. So it was not just theoretical education where students would come to the guru, learn something and go back. The guru would encourage them to travel, go around, test your knowledge, whatever you have learned, test it on the people. So, for example, if you studied medicine, uh, doctors would have to travel and cure patients and thereby they know the efficacy of their learning or they know where they need to improve. So newly minted Vaidyas tested their skills by traveling. And so we have the account of Jivaka, 
is one such uh, vaidya who talks about he different territories he visited and you know he cured people of piles he, the, the surgeries that he conducted on intestines and what all you know there are so many surgeries that have been mentioned which shows that even in those times you know we were doing this uh, we were doing these surgeries um, different kinds of anesthesia was being used uh, in order to put the so that the patients don't feel the pain of course not uh, today it has all advanced to a great extent and it is more painless today but already in those times they they had found ways to control pain and carry out surgeries what kind of diet to be taken before and after all these things are there in our records in sushruta samhita um, in the charaka samhita and so on so vallabhi university in gujarat was set up by nalanda professors i love to give this example was because you know east and west but nalanda is in the east vallabhi is in the west so the prof and you know today we think that uh, oh in ancient times they were not traveling it's only now that we are traveling and wherever we want but just imagine in those times when it was so much harder even then people were traveling for the sake of education so nalanda had professors from southern india and kashmir right um even in ujjain when i visited ujjain you know there was uh, bhaskar acharya who was a very important professor there made so many discoveries he was from karnataka and this another interesting thing thing that i came to know uh, quite recently which is in my uh, second book the golden period of the famous mithila university in bihar see mithila is a center of learning mithila is in bihar and we know that it produced such amazing literature uh, it has um, it was a big center of nyaya now the interesting thing is that it was ruled by uh, someone from karnataka the karnata dynasty from 1097 to 1324 Uh, starting with nanya deva so nanya deva coming from karnataka has moved to mithila and made it a big center of learning and it's not like he has imposed kannada on the people there so the people there the mithila script the mithila language is being developed but the rulers are not from there right they are from karnataka so this shows to you the kind of integration that has happened long before anyone came and called started calling it india you know, nation of india and things like that then raja mayura varman of karnataka he invited uh, hundreds of scholars from ahichhatra which is in uh, modern bareilly uh, near bareilly in uttar pradesh he invited hundreds of scholars to come and settle in karnataka conduct yagnas and teach various subjects and so my ancestors we have a record of migrating from uh, ahichhatra to karnataka so i am from karnataka but when i go back and look at my history i learn that my ancestors came from northern india to southern india and they conducted all these yagnas and they taught all these subjects they were experts in grammar math astronomy and so on and this is just a, the tip of the iceberg if you dig deeper you'll find so many migratory movements which are related to education the teacher was the most respected person in society this is so important because it would came organically it it was it came not by coercion not by you know um, making a rule or making a law and the entire society supported scholars so financially emotionally and personally they supported scholars because they knew that scholars are doing very very important work which will go uh, across the generations if we don't support scholars knowledge is going to get lost it won't be transmitted and the responsibility is on everybody in the society to preserve this knowledge so they did it they 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 had this responsibility and in this way seekers of knowledge were freed from the burden of earning a livelihood so once somebody went on the path of knowledge higher learning that person need, need not would would not have to worry about where the next meal would come from where this person would sleep or where clothes or medicines would come from so that was the society which produced all this knowledge that even today we are mining uh donations to teachers and educational institutions this was so important it was considered a very good deed punya to be donating to a college to be donating to a teacher ensuring or to donate to students so that they would all uh, not have to worry about anything when they were studying so hard waking up early morning sleeping late night memorizing so many things so and and you know then uh, re reflecting on it so they should not be disturbed by any thoughts any problems so for this we people would uh, donate to institutions and the people would get merit from that of course many of them would in their inscription say that you know uh, i have donated to this college they would also take pride in this they also wanted that name for themselves those who uh, the people who donated to colleges kings gifted lands to gurus to build centers of education we see this again and again whenever a guru did a lot of good work 
and the knowledge that he was uh, passing on, he was creating, when it was appreciated, the kings would gift lands so that they would have build bigger structures or they would have uh, more students coming in there and they would get revenue from more villages which will feed those students. I have a, a whole chapter in my book on the special relationship between the Guru and Shishya. So uh, the nuances of learning, how the Shishya would observe the Guru and learn so much because there are certain things which cannot be, which are not written in books. You just learn by observing, uh, you learn by the language that is spoken. And in this way, that is why the students were uh, living with the gurus and the guru would be responsible for the care of the students. The guru would, uh, the health of the students was important to the guru, the sleep, the, you know, everything. that. So the guru would be like the parent who is taking care of all these students. Any student who came with a lot of reverence and respect would usually not be turned away, especially if he had the, if he had the adhikara for that, right? He has, uh, he's, uh, he, he shows that spark in him that he or she can take this knowledge forward. Such students would all be accommodated and now all of them would have to be fed. It was both the guru and his wife who would together be taking care of all these students. And the students would regard the guru's wife as the mother. And this is, this also comes out in so many of the stories that come from ancient times. There was a flourishing ecosystem of learning in India. The spirit of rational inquiry was well developed. Uh, physical phenomena were observed closely and rules of logic were applied to speculate on their causes. So the physical phenomena were looked at both in terms of their beauty, you know, so literature would be there around it, but also examining the causes of why they are happening. You know, that's how astronomy, you see, was so advanced. They knew they knew what is reflected light and what is a star, which is directly a source of light. All these things they were observing. And, uh, and and this knowledge was being documented. Uh, of course, they would use palm leaves and things like that and which uh, would not survive. And then they would need to be copied into newer palm leaves. This was also a job that was there once writing became more and more common. Debate was an important tool for learning. This, this is very important because it shows you our culture. Even today, we are debaters. We have so many opinions. We are constantly warring with each other in terms of ideas and opinions. And this has, this has a long history. References to Tarka Vidya, which is the science of art, uh, logic, uh, debate, can be found in ancient texts. So you'll find it in Ramayana, Mahabharata, Skanda Purana, Yagna Valkya Samhita, Chandogya Upanishad, Manu Samhita, and so many others. You'll find that there's a debate going on. And through that, uh, uh, people are learning, right? Debates are being held in public places, disagreements and then they are developing the tools of uh, evidence what is good evidence what is bad evidence there is so much of literature on that the kings were fond of organizing intellectual tournaments in which superior knowledge debating and public skills were rewarded this is such an important facet of indian uh, knowledge systems that the kings would actively take part in debates because they want to know that people are discussing things and they're not just following without any evidence. So let the evidence be presented. Let that be contradicted. Let people decide what is right and what is wrong. So for this, kings would also organize tournaments and sometimes they would themselves be part of the debate. They would debate too. Janaka was part of that, Lord uh, King Janaka, who is not the same Janaka as in Ramayana. Um, and then we have evidence of uh, kings who are protecting the conquered territories. You know, when kings conquer the territories, they would make sure that the the, the brahmanas and the learned people are not attacked. They are allowed to, uh, to pursue their study undisturbed. They can continue to have their students. So this was also there. You know, um, uh, there is one, uh, uh, there's one book where Vyasa Tirtha was a very well-known uh, guru uh, during the Vijayanagara period. He's saying that, you know, the king, he's telling the king that when you conquer new territories, make sure that you establish new colleges. Uh, in this way, the people who are conquered will also feel good and will respect the new, uh, the emperor, who is your new emperor. So we should recognize that India's imprint is there on every discipline being pursued in colleges and universities. The thinkers of ancient India like Kanada, Sushruta, Charaka, Aryabhata, Varaha Mihira, Brahma Gupta, Bhaskaracharya, Panini, Patanjali, Pingala, Bharata, hundreds of scholars have laid their foundational imprint on almost every scientific discipline that is being pursued today. It is often not recognized because we are we tend to just look at technology and say that, okay, the Western world is so advanced in technology. 
We didn't have iPhones in ancient times. We didn't have this. We didn't have that. But if you look at the science behind all that is being uh, used today, the technologies, the basic thing, the root, the foundation has come from India. Because we had the ecosystem for it. We had that that whole atmosphere where knowledge was being pushed by the society itself. Uh, study of uh, esoteric subjects was being pushed by the society itself. So sciences, medicine, math, language, art, music, philosophy, water management, and myriad other disciplines flowed out from India and provided the base on which the edifice of modern knowledge stands. I think I'm going to skip these two slides on Brahmacharya. Brahmacharya, is a, I have a whole chapter on it, how a student was required to lead a life of discipline and exercise control on every aspect of life, because I feel this is not there in today's uh, education system. Brahmacharya is not being taught or explained to the students. So, so there's a lot of distraction. Today's students are very distracted and they think they can do everything at the same time, but that's not the case. There was the, the single pointed devotion to learning was, was what Brahmacharya was um, and it prepared the students for their whole life. I'm just going to skip it because it's, it's going to take a lot of time and I think I've been allotted only 30 minutes. There was also the importance given to memory training. Today, for some reason, it has been... Uh, been changed to rote learning and rote learning is considered very bad. Of course, I agree with that. The way we learned a lot of things just by memorizing and not understanding, that was very wrong. But there was a certain value given to memory training and I think that needs to be brought back. There is a superior learning curve when memory is enhanced. You know, the way you have to remember things is if it is taught to you, then there is, and if you remember all these things, there is a superior learning curve. And we have evidence of this in, in the form of studies that were conducted recently. Um, the Sanskrit effect was a research conducted uh, by an Italian uh, researcher. And uh, he found out that there's a cognitive improvement that comes by Sanskrit chanting. So all the Sanskrit scholars who were chanting the Vedas, their brains were studied. And it was found that this the portion which is related to cognition was expanding because of that. Now, Yi Jing, the, uh, the Chinese traveler who came to India in the, I think he came in the 6th, 7th century, um, he said that the, the, the Indians, the, the Brahmanas had extraordinary memory and intellectual capacity. So, um, and then we have other records of the British travelers and other, who, uh, after the European uh, colonization of India, the people who came to visit India, they too have pointed out not just the Brahmanas who have good memory, but even the regular people like the Dhobis, the Dhobis who are able to remember everything, where the clothes they have brought, you know, the, uh, from, they, they collect clothes from so many hundreds of households, but they never uh, mix them up. They always give back the clothes to the right people and they remember whom they have got it from. Then uh, we have travelers talking about the memory of the person who gives the dispenser of medicines, the guy who is uh, giving out different concoctions and medicines. And he has stacked up all these medicines on top of each other and he knows exactly what is kept. There are so many medicines, but he knows where what is kept and he takes it out within a minute. The moment somebody walks in and says, I want this medicine. So this also has been uh, documented. So I feel that we should give importance to memory training. We should know how to mem rem remember a lot of things, you know, the shlokas, uh, various other facts, numbers. It will help us tremendously in learning other things. It will make us very good in languages. So even the Veda chanting uh, was designed in a way that there were 11 different ways of chanting, which would help them to remember and they would never get it wrong. And that is why we have been managed to bring down that ancient knowledge and preserve it exactly as it was because we had all these ways of uh, chanting which would uh, which would get hardwired into our memories. The stories were used as educational aids. You know that India is a land of stories, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Purana, and everything was taught through stories. Mathematics was taught through stories. Astronomy was taught through stories. So um, I'll also quickly go through this slide. Uh, Panchatantra. Panchatantra is nothing but Niti Shastra. It is teaching you all the ways of the world, the politics. And if you read the history of Panchatantra also, it's very interesting how, how it was devised as a way of teaching uh, young princes how to rule, how to become good kings by not making them go through the hardship of studying uh, uh, Niti Shastra, the formal uh, uh, Niti Shastra, Artha Shastra. Instead of that, they learned through stories. Panchatantra was written for that. Games were used as educational aids. 
we didn't even know about this until we started all this indic research recently the game of snakes and ladders was actually a game which taught virtues and vices to the people because they were not just numbers right the way we play numbers today is uh, with now numbers with snakes which uh, bring you down from a higher to a lower number or ladders that take you from lower to higher this is something that came from the british because they removed all the layers which were there in the game earlier so the ancient form of the game had virtues on every number right so daya karuna all those would be in the different squares so if you landed on such a square you would get on a ladder and go to a higher level uh and the last the last square would be like vaikuntha or moksha or something like that and then the snakes would be from the swallowing up people who landed on squares with evil uh you know the bad qualities maybe not i mean evil is not something absolute that we had but bad qualities right ahankara krodha all these things would be having a snake attached to them so if you landed on the square you would go down so from a very young age children playing this game would know what are what is a good quality to cultivate and what is a bad quality without any preaching without any lecturing this is just an example but we had chess we had cards even cards playing cards originated in india and so much can be learned from the game of cards and the cards and chess right so that also uh, even the leisurely uh, uh, leisurely routines were also uh, designed to teach you something now this is a a graphic that i've used in my infographic that i've used in my book and it's very popular a lot of people told me that they loved it i have shown how india's knowledge system traveled around the world because india the knowledge that was created out of india it was like a light a lamp which gave light to the whole world that's why i've shown india like a little lamp and you can see how indian knowledge went to uh, went to uh, greece and egypt right from uh, of course by the dating that is done by the chronologists the european chronologists it's from 5th century bc onwards but actually it is even earlier so the knowledge of medicine all these things went to the went to uh, went to the west and on the east it was going to japan china southeast asia so many things went that it it is the longest chapter in my book right uh, so europe europe got it from the arabs so when in indian knowledge systems went to the greeks and from the greeks it went to the arabs and then when these territories were conquered by the europeans that's when indian knowledge went to europe and often times the the credit was not given to india because um, you know in the when the europeans conquered the muslim territories they didn't want to acknowledge that that knowledge has come from those muslim countries so they just copied everything and they uh, put their own name to those books and that's how uh, indians did not get a credit get credit for a lot of knowledge especially mathematics right and then slowly now it is coming out but because it's so long back and because so much of our knowledge is oral it is difficult to prove that india was the source but you can still make a make a lot of uh, inferences the arabs for instance give credit to india they call the subject of mathematics itself as uh, hindisa because it came from hindustan and so many other things you know charaka's oath was what became hippocrates hippocratic oath that is taken by doctors um the asana the knowledge of yoga deities music seven notes of music how is it that all over the world it's seven notes of music right uh, atomic theory chemistry biology and then of course uh, china was you it's a very direct link because china actually kept on asking for more and more scholars to come in and they were we have record of all that uh, uh baghdad also has record of scholars coming and teaching in uh, baghdad and that's a text being translated to arabic and persian so that is how we can establish how knowledge traveled out of india so please uh, if you read the book uh, pay attention to all these details uh this is another uh, uh, chapter in my book how indian knowledge was destroyed uh, by these marauders the islamic invaders who came to india destroyed uh, a series of university in the universities nalanda vikramshila all of them in the bihar bengal area and then later on the you know the sword was carried to different parts of india vallabhi was also destroyed so when temples were being destroyed the centers of learning were also being destroyed so there was a large running of scholars who were carrying manuscripts and running hither and thither wherever they could hide carefully uh, so uh, you would have read of course dr minakshi jains uh, or you would have heard of uh, her book called flight of deities where she is talking about the purohits and uh, you know kshatriyas who were trying to protect the murtis that were 
uh, in the temples, which was the sacred murtis, how they would carry it away and try to take it to safety or they would bury it and come back and retrieve. The same thing was being done with manuscripts. So when uh, this fire and sword was being taken everywhere in India, universities were being destroyed, libraries were being burned. So that time the Brahmanas and also not just Brahmanas, I mean everybody because if the whole society valued learning. We have evidence of Jain scholars also carrying uh, a lot of manuscripts very carefully, burying them in a, and keeping them in underground uh, places so that they are safe. All this has happened. So it's the oral learning that which helped us to preserve our, some, our knowledge and also these manuscripts that were saved by a lot of these brave people. These were also acts of bravery, right? Where they are preserving manuscripts and they're preserving their guru's works. Uh, you know, students are carrying their guru's works. The, the, when they got information that there is, a, there is an army coming to destroy them, many of these students would uh, run beforehand. And that's why the marauders would come and find everything is deserted because people have gone away. That also has happened. And after this period of the Islamic conquest, which was very, very brutal, came the British imperialism, which was also brutal. And uh, it had even more far-reaching effects on our knowledge system because uh, one uh, the previous uh, era was when there were direct attacks on universities and books were burned. But in the British uh, imperialism period, there was uh, what happened was that Indians were made to feel inferior and to lose respect for their own knowledge system and think that uh, all good knowledge was that which came from Europe. So this was another level of destruction which worked at the mind level. The British agenda for Indian education was that domination over India could not last if Western education was not imposed on the masses. They understood very clever, uh, early on that uh, in India there are so many languages and they are, they are all pursuing learning, they all study and they have a systematic way of study. So if we do not break this, we are not going to be able to control them. And of course, there was also the convenience attached to having English speaking natives. So they all so they, they imposed an English medium on schools, uh, on education, so that they would get English speaking natives to work for them. The other uh, uh, thought that uh, besieged them was that the sepoys, because once the British started ruling over India, they needed huge armies. Before that, you know, it was not India was not uh, keeping such huge armies of uh, soldiers who are always being fed and you know kept in readiness for wars. So when the British came, they needed all these armies because they had to control. They wanted to conquer different territories and get the uh, get the loot, get the wealth. So there was also this question of how do you keep the sepoys, the soldiers, loyal to the British Empire, and that's when the you know this whole debate was there on uh, when Brit the Britons started ruling over India that how do they allo allocate money for education? Uh, should they allocate money to all kinds of schools or should they have a certain kind of education system for which they will spend money? So uh, Macaulay's Minute, you would have heard of the Indian Education Act 1835. All this was a culmination of a debate where they realized that they need to impose the English language on the people of India. At the same time, we must remember that a lot of Indian people themselves wanted English medium. So uh, the, a lot of uh, people, because when they were, they found themselves being ruled by the British and they found that they are all impoverished, whereas, you know, Europe is rich, Europe has all this. So they said that uh, we also want to be uh, become like Europeans. So there was this whole section of people who wanted English medium education, who wanted to go to Europe and be like them. And the British were uh, quick to take this uh, these feelings among the people and uh, seize it and, uh, you know, uh, build upon it. So they wanted to create a class of persons who are Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinions, in morals and in intellect. This is what Macaulay's minute said. There was, of course, a bit of a battle between the Orientalists and the Anglicists. The Orientalists uh, were the people who were also uh, from the colonizers uh, section. Uh, they wanted that let all the, uh, the uh, European sciences and various other subjects be translated into Indian languages and taught to Indians through that. So that, you know, they are not, uh, so they are being colonized without being, without changing their language. But then the Anglicists were, they won over the uh, Orientalists. And the Anglicists said, no, we let's not waste our time translating our knowledge into, uh, into their languages. Let's just teach them everything in English. So that's how the European sciences, the European arts, everything started coming to India. And we were forced to leave, let go of our way of looking at the world. You know, the 
the Indian way of looking at things, you know, everything as an integrated whole. So we also started copying them and, you know, separating out our dharma from the, from the knowledge system, the knowledge that we got, uh, the science knowledge. And I always like to mention Dharampal in my talks because Dharampal's work, uh, the beautiful tree and various other works are, are very, very valuable to us to know what pre-colonial education system was like. He uh, spent a lot of time in England and he looked at the archives in those days when photostat machines were not there and he copied down a lot of material which were nothing but the, the surveys that the British had conveyed uh, conducted in India. Uh, so let's look at his astounding findings. He found archival material of extreme significance, a series of surveys that were commissioned by the British government in the 19th century to assess le the level of education, uh, indigenous education in India. So as you know, the British were very systematic. Before they changed India's education system, they did a very important survey in which they found out what is the level of education? What is the level of schooling in uh, different parts of India? So they studied the uh, Madras uh, residency, they studied the Punjab region, they studied the Bengal region. And all these reports were collected and they were found by Dharampal in the libraries in England. So what did Dharampal help us to know through the British surveys? Uh, so it was found that every village in India had a Pachala. This was found by uh, Thomas Munro. He said that. Uh, hunt, there were 100,000 Pachalas in Bihar and Bengal alone. So every village had a Pachala. Just imagine, that's the reason that everybody uh, knew the basic subjects. Reading, writing, the epics, Ramayana, Mahabharata, arithmetic, all were being taught in these schools. Uh, literacy was very high. Of course, this was a decaying system. You know, it was not like it was at its peak when the survey was done by the, the British before they started ruling over India completely. Uh, so the, the, they were already seeing a decaying system. They could make out that this was much more grand in the earlier years. So a hundred years ago, when the Rajas were there, powerful, more powerful, all these schools were getting grants and they were having uh, a much better system. And the teachers were more qualified, more equipped. So what they were seeing was a decaying system. But even then, they found that there was a system. So they, some of these reports speak about dedicated teachers, superior methods of teaching, High attendance, they found high attendance in many schools. And uh, in Tamil Nadu schools, they found in certain schools, the Shudras ranged from 70% in uh, Salem and Tinnaveli to over 84% in South Arcot. So this also, they have documented this, the British surveyors, that in many of the schools, there are more Shudras than the Brahmanas. So this flies in the face of all we have been told about the Brahmin oppression of the Shudras, right? So there was this school, uh, basic schooling, which was available to everybody so that everybody knew how to read and write. And also they knew skills which they could, uh, by which they could earn money. And there were many, many examples of innovative education in pre-British India. Uh, do I have time? Uh, how much time do I have? Yeah, I think uh, you have around 15 minutes. So. Okay. Uh, so one example that I love to give is of Reverend T. Robertson, who uh, found something very interesting and unusual in, in Bengal that he uh, described to his people back, uh, back in England. So he said, uh, look at the way they conduct uh, examinations. The children are simply not afraid of examinations because it's a picnic for them. The students from different schools are all uh, going to, they're all collecting in one place. And then the top student of one school will ask questions to the top student of another school. And if he cannot answer, the question is passed to the next student and then to the next student. In this way, all the students get to ask questions to students of other schools. And they're all having fun. And they'll, of course, get food to eat. They'll have fun. So he was very surprised. And he also noticed that the Brahman students were sitting next to the Shudra students. And sometimes the Shudra students were getting more marks than the Brahman students. So this is something observed by Reverend T. Robertson, if you want to look up. Uh, Reverend Andrew Bell was another guy. So these are Christian missionaries who have come to convert people, but at the same time, uh, they, they, they have documented what they saw in the education system. So Andrew Bell saw that uh, schools were having sand tracing methods of teaching, whereby there'll be a heap of sand outside the schools and the students are learning how to trace the alphabets on them and numbers also. So they don't need notebooks. They don't need a uh, blackboard. And he said, back in England, we are all saying that we hardly have any uh, uh, literacy because we don't have en uh, enough resources to provide blackboards to all the schools. And we don't have notebooks. But look at India. They're just using sand 
and without any big resource, they are able to teach everybody how to read and write. And then he was also impressed by the monitoring system, whereby the older students would monitor the younger students. They would also mentor them. So when the teacher is not present in the class, the older students would take charge. They would make all the younger children uh, revise what they had studied, what they had learned the previous day, make them go through it. So he was very impressed with that. Uh, again, Bell, Andrew Bell said that in England, we have abysmal levels of literacy and we say that we don't have enough teachers to teach. It's, it's very hard to find good teachers. But here, look at how they're using the older students to teach the younger students. Why don't we use this method? And he took all these principles and called it the Madras method and introduced it in England. Uh, by 1821, there were 300,000 children being educated under Dr. Bell's principles. And his ideas were adopted in Europe, West Indies, and even Bogota in Colombia. So I came to know that there is this school, called, this college called Madras College, which still exists in Scotland, in St. Andrews. And uh, this is the one that uh, Andrew Bell started. Now, we, we often think about what happened. We had this education system, which was so great. And then what happened to it? Why, why did we come to the, the abysmal levels of education that we had from the, uh, you know, in the post-independence period? Well, you have to go back and look at the povertization that happened of India. Under the British rule, when all the resources were being diverted to England, trillions of dollars were being looted, India was reduced to a, a shadow of its former self. And then famines broke out because even if they were giving bumper harvests, all that uh, all, the, all that was going to feed the armies to fight the various wars that the British were fighting with the rest of the world. So ev the, everything that India produced, food grains, textiles, steel, gold, silver, minerals, it was all transferred in such a way it became, uh, it was for India, uh, for Br Britain's benefit. So Indian industry was destroyed. You know, the whole power that the Indian, Indian industrialists had, the cottage industries, they were all home-based industries, whereby the families could get rich by selling their uh, products. That was all broken down and they were all forced to uh, produce for England, for export you know, and for money that England would get or they were completely destroyed and news factories were set up where the British would uh, operate it completely in the way they wanted. They were also setting the foreign currency, you know, the, the, the they were pegging, uh, they were bringing down the value of the Indian rupee, which at one time was very high. All this was in their hands. The whole economy was in their hands. So there was no food for teachers and students in Patshalas which is very, very different from what it was in that golden era of India when kings and if the whole society was making sure that there was food for teachers and students. When that was gone, then it was just a matter of time before the Patshala system broke down. Poverty, poverty spread like an epidemic. And then we had they, the British uh, started this whole system of civil servants who were there to brutally fleece the citizens, district collectors, and we still have the same name today in India. And, you know, they would meticulously go to every part of the country to see who all can give them revenue, who all can be squeezed to give money to the British government. And temples were not spared also. So temples where people donated generously so that the temple would spend on education, would spend on celebrating festivals, uh, various other things, even medicine, you know, hospitals. All these things was taken away from temples because now the Britain, British people uh, administrators said everything should be given to us and we will decide where that money should be spent. Mother tongues were related to second languages. This whole concept of first language, second language, all that came from England. And M.K. Gandhi said in 1931 that the British had left India more illiterate than it was just 100 years before. So when the schools were broken down, when English was imposed, then obviously those who could not go to those schools, they were all rendered illiterate because they can't even get jobs because they don't know English. The, um, and then today, and then, you know, that whole thing continued with the policies, the government policies did not change much, change much even after we got independence. And India still has one of the highest numbers of illiterate people. And by the end of the 19th century, most of India's indigenous industries had been wiped out. The prosperous artisans had turned into paupers. A lot of people were forced to go to agriculture because now they were no longer able to teach. The schools were not there. They were no longer able to produce fine works of art. Uh, craft, they had to all work on the farms and work for somebody else. So the balance between industry and agriculture was destroyed. There was a spike in landless agricultural laborers. Per capita, dependence on agriculture became unsustainably high. 
So everybody going into agriculture, right? Which is a very unfavorable situation. And, and under such conditions, education could hardly be expected to be a priority. Now, we also have some Brits who called out the damage done to India's educational heritage. Uh, we have people like Campbell. He was a civil servant in Bellary. And he said the degeneration of education was attributable to the transfer of capital of the country from the native government to the Europeans, restricting it, restric restricting it by law from employing it, even temporarily in India, and daily draining it from the land. A lot of people did notice that the way they were collecting taxes from India, it was sometimes even as high as 50% of the produce. The way we are extracting taxes, it's just impoverishing them. And it's leading to illiteracy, leading to a uh, very bad situation, very bad uh, health situation. All this was also noticed by a number of British uh, administrators. Then there is Ludlow, who wrote in British India, in every Hindu village which has retained its old form, I am assured that the children generally are able to read, write and cipher. But where we have swept away the village system, as in Bengal, there the village school has also disappeared. So I come to the last few slides. What can we take from our educational heritage? So when we talk about the great glory of India's educational system, what can we do with that understanding? I think we should become grateful inheritors of our educational heritage. Um, our curriculum must include a brief history of every discipline as a way of inculcating healthy civilizational pride. So we are we have to honor our pitrus. Honoring our pitrus and gurus is a time honored tradition in India. And uh, today the NEP is uh, the national the new education policy. The national education policy has taken note of this, and they are trying to bring in this history of every discipline in the subjects, but it is still an ongoing process. It's still not, it's going on. It will take many, many years for all the textbooks to be teaching subjects in that way. So we should know when we study mathematics that, you know, how did math, how did all these principles come? There should be an introduction to the history of those subjects. Then we should include uh, relevant and useful elements from our educational heritage from our disciplines like Nyaya Shastra, Ganita, Ganita Jyotisha, Vyakarana, we should include that because the way we studied languages, the way we uh, pronounce different alphabets, all those things, if we, if we learn it the way we were studying it and then we go on to the modern ways of learning, it's going to lay, lay a very good foundation for our understanding of subjects, for languages and for logic. If Nyaya Shastra is taught in schools, uh, it will definitely make them think of everything in terms of evidence. What is the evidence to have? we have for uh, saying something, for asserting something as true or, or not, right? So, Ganita, uh, Nyaya Shastra and Ganita Josha, Jyot, Jyotisha. So, when you study Jyotisha, Jyotisha is actually astronomy. It's mathematics. When you study that, it makes you also very observant about natural phenomena, about the stars in the sky. And it makes the subject very interesting. So, when you study it with re reference to the Indian way of teaching, Indian knowledge systems, the whole subject becomes more interesting. And then students will research on their own. The other thing is decoloniality. We need to get back our own Indic lenses to view the world. And we need to define and analyze problems and solve them with our own worldview. Okay. So the, th the what happens is when you go back and study your own educational heritage, then you will start viewing the world with your the original lenses that we had, that you had. The gurus gave us a certain way of looking at the world, uh, the integrity of everything, how you know all disciplines come together, the inter interdisciplinarity of, of every knowledge system. All these things come to you and you get decolonized when you study your own subjects in the way they were taught in ancient times. Learn a bit of that uh, and then come to the modern subjects. So there has to be a design in such a way that we weld the relevant aspects of the ancient education system with the modern uh, pedagogy. And also I make this point that uniqueness is a desired attribute in global educational institutes. So today when we uh, students today are applying to colleges all over the world, the colleges want to see what is unique about this student. Now, so when we go back to our own Indian system or Indian knowledge system, it will bring uh, make us unique in the way we present our cases, the way we talk about things. So that is also a reason I feel that we should uh, uh, to weld the ancient system with the new one. So why should we be rooted in Indian knowledge systems? Our Jnana Parampara makes us take a big picture perspective. 
it, which is very different from Abrahamic systems. So we always, uh, we, we see beyond our body, our state, our country boundaries and reflect on all the connected systems and what is good for humanity. So that is why when we are rooted in our Jnana Parampara, we look at everything as a whole. And I say that if the world was rooted in Indian knowledge systems, we would not be facing the huge disasters of uh, modern times like climate change, high carbon footprint, atmospheric pollution, accumulation of garbage in landfills, pesticide-laden food, rivers filled with toilet waste. When I look at all these problems of today's times, I feel that it's come because we were not rooted in our own knowledge systems. So I also like to quote Einstein, who said that you cannot solve problems using the same thinking that was used in creating the problems. So if you're rooted in the in the Western knowledge system, then you are, will not be able to solve the problem because it came from the same thinking. So that's why I feel that we should be going back and getting rooted in our own Jnana Parampara. Uh, and this is a quote that I like to give, wherein uh, there is this Professor W. Norman Brown from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which appeared in the May 1939 issue of a certain uh, document. And he said, we believe that no department of study, particularly in the humanities, in any major university, can be fully equipped without a properly trained specialist in the Indic phases of its discipline. We believe that every knowledge which aims to prepare its graduates for intelligent work in the world, which is to be theirs to live in, must have on its staff a scholar competent in the civilization of India. I think this is just amazing. This person has captured the essence of why we need to study the Indian knowledge systems. So mm. with this, I've come to the end of my presentation. Um, mm. If you have not got my book already, I would request you to order it. Ask your local stores, your local libraries to get this book. And here is my email address if you would want to get in touch with me for anything. Yeah. I will now stop sharing. Yeah, so there are a few questions in the chat, so I'll ask them first. So one question from me is that uh, education and gender, right? Uh, these days, the modern education system, like uh, there is no like gender differentiation in education streams. How was it in like ancient Indian system? Also, uh, one question that one of the listeners asked was about caste and Kanchailia. Some scholars say, oh, there was a monopoly of a certain caste on education and so uh, those sort of things. So how do you address that? So I think both questions are somewhat related. So uh, maybe okay. you can answer them. And... So I think when it comes to gender, so we had the, you know, the concept in ancient times that the all the, the, the masculine gender as well as the feminine gender needs to be preserved in all its, its glory. And there was also the tritiya. There was also a tritiya under which all the other genders came. So uh, it is not like, you know, uh, the other, the third gender was not recognized. Of course, today we have LGBTQ and we have all those terminologies, but the Tritiya covered everything, whatever was there. So in um, ancient times, the, 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 it was about playing to the strength of your gender. So it was recognized that the female gender, which has to procreate, which has to produce, uh, they, they, must pro they must protect their energies. So there are certain things that they should be doing so that they, they stay protected. Their organs are protected. And so certain things were uh, uh, were uh, told to them to be for, for them to do. And similarly, the males, their male energy also has to be protected because so that they, you know, the, the un, there was this understanding that we have to procreate, we have to produce the next generation. This responsibility is there on all of us that we have to procreate and create the next generation. So the gender was viewed in that way. Right. So the mother was the first teacher. It was well understood that the mother is the first guru because the child learns from the mother. And then all these skills, if you realize in ancient times, entire families were preserving knowledge. Right. All the skills we have, whether it is painting, sculpture, uh, you know, think of all the carpentry, all these uh, skills, Ayurveda, you know, the doctors, entire families were preserving this knowledge. So it was not never seen as a conflict of gender. So males, females, you know, little males, young females, everybody's together in this, uh, in, in pro protecting this knowledge, right? That is the way they viewed it. The jatis were seen as actually specializations of different uh, knowledge and skills, and they were transmitted in that way. So that is the way they looked at it. So women were also engaged in preserving that knowledge. So if there is a family of a Vaidya, 
and the vaidya uh, the the husband is the vaidya uh, the wife would be very much involved in preparing all the medicines and she would also know all those things what these medicines are good for and the husband would be doing the sadhana so that because in those days medicines were not given just like that you know they would there is the medicine the vaidya would also pray that the student the, the patient is cured of whatever disease and so that sadhana the husband would be doing the wife would be helping in preparing children would be helping helping in collecting the herbs from the forest all these things so it was a always a family enterprise so that's why you know this gender problem that we are seeing today is also a reflection of the breakdown of the community when communities break down people are living far away all these things are happening so we are broken into all this and then we have these issues so in those days there wasn't really that problem okay uh, so you would see that there are a lot of uh, rishikas in ancient times we have mention of women who who decided not to go the in the grihastha ashrama so brahma vadinis for instance they the ones who decided of course they would not be in huge numbers because it was recognized that you know if all the women or the greater part of women start going into esoteric studies and, and devote a lot of time to it then they would the society would suffer and so it would so happen that there would not be many women who would want to uh, give up all the pleasures of life and just focus on learning there would not be that many but those who did they were doing it plenty of them so we do hear of gurukulas where the there is a woman who is a rishi rishika who is a guru and students are learning from her we we have evidence of this in mahabharata ramayana various other texts and you see the goddess of learning is saraswati why would we even do that if we did not respect women as uh, as uh, as embodiment of knowledge right so saraswati is the devi of learning you are every for every skill also they pray to saraswati to give us knowledge and shakti is also the energy power is also feminine in nature that is the way it was perceived of course there will be individual people bad people who will be exploiting women all this would have also happened but within the civilization the understanding was not that there is some conflict of genders and all that right so the everybody is doing their dharma that is the way it was viewed um, and you know you have so many texts written by women you know we even have a text on gynecology that was written by a woman which was translated into arabic uh, so we women were also producing knowledge so it's not that we were uh, it's only today's lenses that we are applying on an ancient knowledge system to to make all these uh, create these conflicts that you know women were being subdued and they were not studying and things like that of course the practical value has to be understood women if you know when women women who have to produce children will have to focus on a lot of things they have to take care of the child's health and by nature also there was also focus on what is the true nature of a woman what is what gives her great joy and indeed there are many women who love motherhood they love to take care they love to cook for the children they love to cuddle with the children you know so that part of women was also was also understood right uh, and so they were not it was not a culture where a woman has to compete with women uh, men and show i am equal to men i can do everything that you can do and uh, so i don't want to be a mother you know it was not that way uh, it was like you be true to yourself what do you like to do and then follow that and be true to that and that's why we have many women who were doing grihastash in doing grihastash but they were taking care of the household but if they had great skills and talents it we have so many instances of the husbands ensuring that there's a teacher coming home to teach the teach the woman so if she has great skill in uh, uh, in writing poetry she's still doing that even though she's married right it's mentioned in kama sutra dr bharat gupta has pointed out in many of his lectures how the the husband is expected to either teach his wife if she has not continued her education after she has to do it after marriage or a, or or get a teacher to come and teach her at home so the education continued for women even after marriage but yes there would be lesser time for them because there'll be so many responsibilities so this practicality aspect has to be understood that is the i hope i have addressed the gender aspect uh just give me a moment uh the caste question is a very big one now so when it comes to caste that is something that has also again been imposed on us the definition of caste we get the portuguese uh, casta word and then every because the it's when the foreigners studied us in terms of their caste system that all this caste came into existence again it was a very interdependent society right so we had um, 
we had people who were devoted to the uh, arts and the various skills being propagated. And uh, so these various jatis were engaged in those uh, skills and they were apprenticing, they were getting the students and they were teaching them. Then there were those who went into higher Vedic study. You must remember that Vedas were considered the most sacred of all texts. And there was a certain lifestyle to be adopted if you want to study the Vedas because the rishis who have revealed this knowledge or who have um, got this knowledge from the universe have got it because they lived in a certain lifestyle. And that is how this whole con so concept of uh, Brahman, those who are dedicated to studying the Brahman, they became the Brahmanas, right? And the Brahmanas had to maintain a certain lifestyle, which is like, you know, they will be eating sattvic food. They will be getting up early in the morning. They have all these rituals to follow. They have to feed the birds. They have to feed other people. They have to all do all these things before they eat themselves. All these things, that hygiene, they have to maintain the highest level. Then they have to... Um, give up pleasures. They have to live a very austere life. They cannot be wearing very expensive clothes, wearing a lot of jewelry. The Brahmanas were supposed to be the most frugal, whereas the others, uh, the other um, Varnas, they could be more ostentatious in the way they lived. But again, they also were told that uh, you have to try and live, uh, be detached from all this. Like even when you are in Grihastashrama, you are not the doer. Always remember that there is a higher force that is making you do things. So that is how society was divided and it was very interdependent and it was functional. It was it made, it helped us to become the richest country in the world. So the way the Varna Jati system, the Kula system existed, it was designed in such a way that everybody was realizing their potential and they were uh, generating skill, uh, generating knowledge. They were going deep into subjects they were, you know, I mean, ours was the country which came out with uh, the concept of zero, the concept of negative numbers, infinity, so many concepts that came from our country. And that came because there was this division of the society in a way that everybody was uh, performing to the max, to the max ability. Now, somewhere along the line, yes, it did deteriorate. Uh, let us not forget the period when we were invaded, when uh, the whole society was in disarray. That has caused a lot of problems in the way our society functioned. So the freedom given to women, a lot of freedoms were lost during that period when we were invaded. Uh, you know, girls were being kidnapped, they were being raped and all these things happening. And thus curbs were being put on women that by the parents, by the brothers that you cannot go out, you know, you cannot do this. Marry them early so that they don't, um, you know, once they're married, there are, there's lesser chance of predatory people taking them away. So these aberrations came as a reaction a uh, lot of things that you are seeing today, you are assuming that it has come to us in a pristine form uh, in the, what we call the caste system. But I can tell you that there's a lot of lot of deterioration, uh, uh, degradation that you are seeing and thinking that that is how it existed. No. So th this is a reaction, a lot of things that you have seen. And of course, who can forget the, the caste survey that the British conducted in the 18th, 19th century, whereby they, they just asked people uh, what caste you belong to and put them into some document and then they got frozen in time, right? And that's how so many people who are actually Kshatriyas, you know, they are meant to be warrior warriors, they are now put into uh, lower caste, this and that, I mean, upper, higher, all this high, low thing, you know, making it uh, a matter of, uh, uh, you know, bringing that certainty into it. That happened when the British uh, started studying us like a species and, and imposing their worldview on us. So that is the thing. And then once we became povertized, impoverished, uh, you know, this whole grabbing of power, grabbing of wealth, all that happened. No longer were the Brahmanas sticking to their uh, dharma, wherein they are supposed to be uh, not making money. And they're just focusing on Brahman, you know, of teaching, going from village to village, te teaching them about things. You know, if you look at the way we were... The Brahmanas used to be going to people in the village, informing them about the date because they were the timekeepers also, the Brahmanas would tell them that, okay, you know, the Purnima is coming, you all need to get ready, you know, these things. So the, that that was the society. The, the sadhus going from village to village, telling everybody that, you know, this is how you uh, live your life. If there is any marital discord, this is how you solve it. You know, you should not have ego. So this is the way that all the different, uh, you know, sectors of society were cooperating in Every village had uh, a range of jatis, a range of varnas, and they were all cooperating. And they knew that the other one also must exist and, and flourish. That's how it was. And education also was that way. Any sincere seeker who went to study a subject and established that he to the guru, 
that I'm going to use the knowledge that you give me for the benefit of mankind. I'm not going to use it to become rich and all those things that the guru would teach uh, when it comes to Vedic knowledge. And of course, when it came to artisans, they knew that you are coming to learn because you want, uh, you want to make money out of this. But again, you must have the, the shraddha. You must not do it in a very arrogant way. You should have humility. So that's how the gurus used to decide which of, the, which of them would be good shishyas for them. And they would select it. And that was their prerogative. We can't deny them that. I hope this answers to some extent. Yeah, thanks for that answer. I think we can take one more question if anyone wants to go ahead and ask directly. Yeah, if not, then, you know, I think we are well over time. It was a very informative uh, session. Oh, we are well over time, so I spoke a lot. <laughs> no, that's Sorry. fine. I think it's a sign that everyone loved it. And uh, yeah, I think you have also given your email address on the slide. So, you know, people yes, can reach out to you directly. I have posted the book links in the chat, whoever wants to buy the book. Uh, yeah, and thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this very informative talk. And thanks, everyone, for listening in. So I have one request. If you can send me all the questions because I couldn't read the chat. If you can send them to me, I would love to look at that. Yeah, Even the comments, sounds, feedback. Yes. I'll, I'll just copy the whole conversation. Yes. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.